This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. The following is being brought to you by remote transcription from a college lecture hall appearance. One prominent example of advanced insight into the new role of religion in our generation is that of Dr. William G. Pollard. This eminent scientist has written that in the known universe, quote, man recognizes four dimensions, height, depth, width, and time. But in fact, he hypothesizes, there may be many different dimensions. And if so, and I quote him, then the amount of external reality which is transcendent to us, invisible and unseen, but everywhere touching us, is far vaster in extent than the world of space-time which is visible and comprehensible to us. I continue to quote, Now is going to be a greater time of crisis than the human species has ever before experienced in the history of this planet. Man's faith in what he can do on his own and his childlike faith in the capacity of science and technology to solve every problem is going to fade before the terrible problems of such an age. Man will more and more feel himself lost and helpless as he crowds together on a planet too small to hold and feed his numbers, where the byproducts of his science and technology increasingly pollute and ruin his environment. In such a time, many will despair and lose hope. Only those who can find some real, transcendent reference beyond space and time will be able to live creatively and courageously. Therefore, Dr. Pollard concludes, the most important important discovery that anyone can make today is the discovery of the reality of God. This sort of thought in the scientific world is beginning to prepare the conceptual way for the religion of the future, the worldwide family of God, the concept that all of us are infinitely valuable sons and daughters kin to the Creator. An international statesman said recently, we are delicately poised right now. I genuinely think that the next decade could either be a period that in retrospect will look like one of the great periods of human creativity, or it could be the beginning to an extraordinary disarray. A Stanford Research Institute study concluded recently that our current conceptual revolution demands that humankind evolve a more spiritual concept of itself. This is a quote from the Stanford Research Institute evaluation, that humankind must evolve a more spiritual concept of itself if it is to cope with new challenges, that we must have a self-image which, quote, reinstates the transcendental, the spiritual side of man so long ignored. Professor Jay Forrester of Massachusetts Institute of Technology has written, On religion rests the responsibility for maintaining long-term values and preventing the collapse of operating goals as society undergoes transition. And Dr. Dennis Meadows of Dartmouth College says, A society released from struggling with the many problems caused by runaway material growth may have more energy and ingenuity available for solving other problems. These pursuits that many would list as the most desirable and satisfying activities of man, including religion, he writes, would then begin to flourish once again. Historians, futurists, scientists, and philosophers are in agreement that now is one of the most unusual times in human history. I believe it is a time of dawning spiritual renaissance. Truth can exist in the sunlight, but falsehood can only survive in shadows. Oceanographers have found that in the cold, dark, underwater world of the deep seas, there are strange fish which live a mile down where the water pressure on them is one ton per square inch. And indeed, these fish are so adapted to life in the ocean depths that if they are caught and brought up to the surface, they will burst open from the pressure change and will instantly perish. So falsehood, likewise, thrives easily in the deep, dark, and murky psychological seas of superstition and human ignorance. But when brought up into the clear sunlight and the atmosphere of rational inquiry and thought, falsehood cannot survive. Only truth can survive in the sunlight. And truth, beauty, and goodness reveal the divine and loving nature of the infinite God who is the source of all reality. Truth, beauty, and goodness can lead to the heights of worship if one will but be led. When Yehudi Menuhin, the child prodigy, 
and master violinist who took his first lesson at the age of four played a brilliant concert in Berlin on one occasion when he was 11 years old. The famous physicist Albert Einstein came backstage afterward and exclaimed, you have once again proved to me that there is a God in heaven. And yet earthly beauty, truth, and goodness are but fleeting shadows of the infinite glory which is God. Two years ago at the World Conference on Religion and Peace in Princeton, New Jersey, there met 337 representatives of the world's religions, including Christian, Buddhist, Confucian, Hindu, Jewish, Jainist, Muslim, Sikh, Shinto, and Zoroastrian. The conference concluded with the participants agreeing on the wording of the following declaration. Quote, that the power of active love uniting men and women in the search for righteousness will liberate the world from all injustice, hatred, and wrong that modern civilization may someday be changed so that neighborly goodwill and helpful partnership may be fostered, that all religions will increasingly cooperate in creating a responsible world community." End of quote. The great religious and philosophic traditions of the world, if they will thus join together in the quest for peace on earth and goodwill among humankind, possess the power to unite men and women spiritually as they never could be united economically or politically or militarily. And that is at the heart of our task in the dawning spiritual renaissance. There's a new spiritual liberation in living in the certitude we are infinitely valuable, that death is but a twinkling of a transition, that life goes on, that personality survival is real, that we can know God experientially. You've seen bugs flying around a porch light at night, whirling, spinning, colliding. That is one of the closest analogies I can imagine to much of humankind, bumping, reeling, revolving in the frantic frenzy to get rich or pursue power or find fame. And when their lives are over, many have accomplished little more of real value than a swarm of gnats after a hard night at the light bulb. Dizzy, distraught, disappointed. That is how many a person feels after a lifetime of pursuing only earthly things which cannot satisfy the spiritual questings of the soul. Truly, as it is written, man cannot live by bread alone. Our hunger is for the finding and knowing of God. There is a thirsting of spirit which burns like salt in the soul. As Augustine has written, O God, thou hast made us for thyself, and the heart of man is restless until it finds its rest in thee. Professor Edwin A. Burt of the Cornell University Philosophy Department has written, Now for the first time in history, all the religions have been thrown into intensified interaction with each other in virtue of the same forces that compel increased interaction all over the earth in economic, political, educational, technological, and artistic spheres. The whole world is a single melting pot in all these areas as never it has been before. Religion will surely be as deeply affected as any other phase of human life, he writes, and the process would seem to be a cumulative one. What does this betoken for the future? Professor Burt writes, I venture to suggest that religion may still be in its youth, with the greatest part of its history lying ahead instead of behind. Philosophy is still in its youth, the breathtaking insights which could do for modern thought what Plato did for the experience of the Greeks may not as yet even have been glimpsed. Art is still in its youth, the inspiring creations that will appear when future artists freed from their obstructive fears and their rebellious iconoclasms come to share these insights cannot now even be imagined. So with every other phase of cultural life, political structures, economic habits, educational policies, even modes of recreation and relaxation, so too with religion. The future indeed is bright with promise. But it is also a brim with challenge, and we must meet that challenge with valor and vigor, and we shall bring upon this earth, if we do, one day a spiritual renaissance which will make this world new. The fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man, these are ideas whose times have come. We must work for them and dream for them and be willing to live for them. Science asks the quantitative questions, how many, how big, how far, how much. Religion asks qualitative questions, how valuable, how meaningful, how good, true, or beautiful. 
These questions and their answers can never really conflict. Science can explain the geology of a mountain, but it cannot explain the theology of the Sermon on the Mount. Science can sort facts, but it cannot judge values. Only philosophy and religion are able to converse with these higher realms of spiritual thought and wisdom. For each of us possesses a sense of eternal meanings and values, and only cosmic consciousness can understand and fathom these higher things. Confucius, the ancient sage of China who lived in the 6th century BC, traveled from place to place for years, attempting to find a prince or a ruler who would accept and follow his doctrines of justice and honesty. But he was predominantly ignored, misunderstood, and after some 50 years of active teaching, Confucius died almost unknown. Only years later were his teachings recognized. On every dusty page of world history, we find the story of some great man or woman whose noble idealism seemed senseless or futile at the time, but who later came to be honored for his or her wisdom. Let us resolve to drink freely from this fountain of our forebearers' courage and ourselves dare fearlessly to seek and live the truth as we can find it. For Christ declared, seek and you will find, but I conceive this to be a proportional statement, that the more you seek, the more you will find. Seek only a little, and chances are you will find but little. It's like a child on a traditional Easter egg hunt, if with only casual interest, he rather idly wanders here and there looking for the eggs, he will not find nearly as many as the child who with zest and enthusiasm scrambles about under bushes and behind the trees and hedges in the search. So with spiritual seeking, seek but little and you will find but little, but seek greatly and you will find greatly. Seek spiritual truth half-heartedly and you will likely find but half a heartful. But seek with all your heart, and you will find a veritable heart full of peace, joy, and the love of God and the love of others, and will have a sense of real kinship, vital companionship and fellowship with the God of this universe, who is the inspiration of one's soul and one's life forever, for all eternity. Spiritual things are the most important things, the most vital, the most joyous, the most real things in all of human life. And their source is God. The most real experience one can have in all this universe is the finding and knowing of God and a sense of eternal values and eternal life and the quest for perfection. I desire that for each and all of you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. The preceding has been brought to you by remote transcription from a college lecture hall appearance. Write to us, will you? at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell that mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Denham Grimsley saying, May God's will be done by you. Good day.